Welcome. Our last student speaker for tonight is Margaret Peterson, and Margaret will be talking about visualizing chaos. Um, next fall, Margaret will be going into mechanical engineering at the U. Without further ado, Margaret. Okay. This summer, um, I worked under the guidance of Dr. Bob Hess, actually, with my colleague, Winston Hardy, who expanded on the previous research done by Andrew Nikoski. Um, So just a quick overview before I start my talk. I'm going to start with a review on root finding methods, which will lead us to the Hanson Patrick root finding method, which is, which is actually what um, Nikoski, myself, and Hardy used. Um, then I'll give you an overview of Nikoski's program and how we adjusted that using the sign choice and the denominator, which I promise will make more sense later. Um, I'm sure this image looks familiar to many of you as a 2D visualization of chaos on the complex plane. What Nikoski did last summer is he took this um, 2D visualization and he mapped it onto a sphere stereographically, mapping the unit circle to the equator of the sphere. Um, these images were cool in the sense that you could see what was going on at infinity on this finite surface. Uh, before I dive into that program, I'll just give a quick review on root finding methods. Um, here we have a generic polynomial f of x, that's that blue line there. And say you take an initial guess at a root. So we'll call that initial guess x1. If you draw a line straight up from x1, you're going to intercept x, or you're going to intercept f of x at the point x1 from f of x1. Um, consider the tangent line at that point that's also going to run into the x-axis, and we can call that point x2. Once again, if you draw a line straight up, um, you're going to intercept f of x at the point x2 from f of x2. Um, as you can see, if you continue this process, you move closer and closer to a root. Um, like I said, that equation for a tangent line is really crucial. It's the equation written above there. Um, finding the x-intercept is just basic algebra. You set that y equal to 0 and solve for x, which is the bottom equation. Um, if I write it like this, it may look more familiar to many of you as Newton's method for finding roots. Um, Newton's method is probably the most popular method for finding roots. However, it's definitely not the only method. There's Euler's method, Lockyer's method, Haley's method, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, they were all derived separately, and after all of those were established, these two mathematicians came in, um, Hanson and Patrick, and they um, introduced a new variable, alpha. And what this alpha variable did is by varying alpha, um, you could actually derive these other um, root finding methods, which was really cool. So for example, you have Ostrowski's method, Healy's method, Euler's method. Um, I'm not going to derive those all for you. You can do that later tonight for some fun, maybe. Um, <laughs> however, as you can see, they all involve these alpha values, and so you can clump them into one big family. Um, so, with Nikoski's program, you inputted a variable for alpha, and then an initial polynomial, any polynomial you want. Um, in this presentation, you'll see polynomials with smaller roots, just, and that's just because um, they're easier to visualize, however, you can plug in any polynomial. Uh, and then it returns a sphere that's colored, depending on how many roots the polynomial has. So, if it's an order six polynomial, it's going to have six different colors. Uh, then the colors are shaded, depending on how long it takes that root, or how long it takes the initial point Z at to converge to a root. So um, just looking at this image here, all of these red areas, these are all converging to the same root, so this red area, that red area, etc. Um, and then these darker areas are taking longer to converge than these brighter areas. Um, and this is just a 2D visualization. Okay, so when we were doing the Kowski's program and we were working with it, um, we really weren't getting the results we were expecting. One big thing that um, was bothering us was that Alpha, as we varied alpha, the images kind of jumped around, so the images didn't really vary continuously as alpha varied. So that was bothersome to us, as well as the fact that we really weren't getting significant shading. So it appeared as though either it was going black right away and we were getting divergence, or it was just completely bright and everything was converging. Um, so one thing we found in Nikolsky's program is that we really couldn't figure out how he picked the choice between plus and minus in the denominator of a hanson patrick root finding method. Um, first equation above, is the hanson patrick root finding method. Uh, it can be written equivalently as the equation below. Um, so since Preston and I can figure out how Nikolowski had done it in his program, we just scratched it, and we decided to write it in a way, oh, punker. <laughs> <laughs> in a way that um, made more sense to us. OK. Um, so we want these z knots to converge to z. So um, it made sense to us that you want that fractional part of the equation to be um, as small as possible because you want that difference between z and z not to get as small as possible. So you said choose the choice that um, maximizes the magnitude of the um, denominator of that fraction. Uh, however, that did not work for negative values of alpha. 
as you can see here. Um, we were getting some funky looking images where it looked like there was a light shining out right from where those roots were. So we thought, okay, logically, we're getting things that work for positive alpha. The images were varying continuously and we were getting good shading. So for the opposite case, for negative alpha, why not choose the opposite choice or the sign that minimizes the magnitude of the denominator? Um, so this is exactly what I just said. If alpha is positive, choose the denominator with the largest magnitude. Else, if it's negative, choose the denominator with the smallest magnitude. Um, really informative slide. Okay, so here we have a six degree polynomial. Um, as you can see, there are six different colors. Um, along the steps, the alpha steps I choose along the way. Um, I did the or I did the popular ones. So we have negative one for Healy's method, zero for Ostrowski's method. Um, since it's a six degree polynomial, you have Wagner's method, so one over n minus one. In this case, that's one over six minus one, which is one fifth. And then um, Euler's method, um, alpha equal to one, and then Newton's method, alpha equal to infinity. I also <coughs> did some steps intermediately just so you can get an idea of how these images vary continuously with alpha, because that's kind of a weird concept. So here we have Cayley's method, alpha equal to negative one, alpha equal to negative point six, alpha equal to negative point two, Ostrowski's method, alpha equal to zero, Laguerre's method, alpha equal to one fifth, alpha equal to point six. Euler's method, alpha equal to 1. Newton's method, alpha equal to infinity. So as you can see, we are getting convergence, which was really cool for both positive and negative alpha, as well as um, some significant shading. Unfortunately, not all programs are perfect. Neither is ours. Um, take a look at this polynomial here. We ended up with some weird distortions, because that just happens when you're mapping a plane out of a sphere. Um, especially in this case, I'd like you to note the roots. We have negative 1, negative 3i, 3i, and 100. Um, the yellow area is the area converging to negative one. It appears as though at least two thirds of these initial points you see that are converging to that um, negative one. However, if you look at it from a planar view, you can see that that's not the case. Here we have x and y ranging from negative 100 to 100, and that yellow spot is actually really small. Um, so we changed our program so you could change the radius of the sphere that you map to the equator, so that, that was really helpful in um, doing polynomials that had these larger roots. So at the end of the summer, um, one thing that was still bothering me was the fact that we had two different cases for positive and negative alpha. Um, so uh, I thought we were sacrificing some convergence rates as well as the efficiency of our program. So I created some new programs in MATLAB. Um, each one works exclusively with the polynomial x cubed minus one because that's a popular polynomial. It's easy to see those um, easy to see those roots. And um, and then the only thing I varied in each case was how I chose the choice between plus and minus in the denominator. So the first one was exactly the same as that program that we written in Java that was printing the spheres. Um, if L is positive, choose the denominator with the largest magnitude. L, if it's else, if it's negative, choose the denominator with the smallest magnitude. Um, we found that there are really two popular ways to choose alpha. Uh, the second way, or to choose the sign, sorry. The second way had to do with the argument as opposed to the magnitude of the denominator. So um, the second way, unfortunately, it also needed these two cases. Uh, this one called for choosing the sign that minimizes the difference between the arguments of z and z naught for positive alpha, and then minimizing the difference between the arguments of z and z naught for negative alpha. So that really wasn't beneficial in any way. Sometimes they created the same images. Um, so as you can see, this program plots each iteration. So each one of those nodes is a uh, new point z, and then the line connecting them is colored depending on whether it's choosing plus or minus. Um, so for the case alpha equals 0.75, the images are the same. For alpha equal to 0.1, not only is it choosing a different sign in the denominator, but the two different methods are actually converging to different roots, which we thought was interesting. Um, and then here's just a kind of crazier example. We have a negative alpha value, alpha equal to negative 3. Uh, both methods are, are, are converging. Um, I never found an example where one diverged and one converged. However, um, pretty, uh, I would say it was pretty standard that the magnitude method was more, um, that it converged faster than the argument method. So I kind of just scratched the argument method altogether. Um, what wrong with? Okay. So finally, we revisited how Nikolsky had programmed it um, in his program. Here's how we interpreted it initially: if alpha times f prime is equal to that fractional, or is equal to the square root part, if that's greater than zero, choose plus. Else, if that's less than zero, choose minus. Um, we wrote this into the program, but after a bit's thought, you realize, okay, well that's pretty much the same thing as that first magnitude method because those are the two components of the denominator. So if you dot them together and you get that it's greater than zero, then it means they're the same size. So adding, or they're, they're the same sign. So adding them together is going to maximize the magnitude of the denominator. So that really wasn't helpful at all. Um, 
So, oh, here we just have for negative and positive alpha. I don't know why that was on the other one. Okay, so as you can see, the images are exactly the same because essentially it's exactly the same method. Okay, however, we realize that if you remove that alpha value, you take care of the two different cases. Um, in this case, if you dot that f prime with the square root part of it, and you have a positive alpha, then the signs stay the same, so you choose plus and you maximize the magnitude of the denominator. However, if you throw in a negative alpha value, you're going to swap the sign of the first one, so choosing plus is going to minimize the magnitude of the denominator. Um, so here's that dot method with the magnitude method at the end. Oh, wait, I went the wrong way. There we go. Okay, so um, here you can see the new dot method with the magnitude method and the argument method. Once again, the dot method and the argument method are the same. That was good. Um, something a little more interesting for negative values of alpha, this new dot method was actually a lot more efficient than the other two methods. As you can see, they're all converging to the same root. However, in the first two cases, um, it's really ugly. And, ooh, oops, and it's taking a long time. I swear off of this. Um, but in the first, in the last case, it's a much more direct path, and it's changed. It's choosing that same sign the whole way. Um, some things we want to work with for the future with this program. Um, one question we have is: Are these negative alpha values advantageous for specific functions or situations? Um, we found in some cases, using negative alpha values, you get real numbers along the way. For each of these not, so that's nice if you don't have like your T89 in your back pocket. Um, another question we had is, do the methods vary continuously for all complex values of alpha? We did a little bit of work with complex values for alpha. I wish we could have done more because you got some really cool images with that. However, unlike with real values, we weren't getting continuity, which was kind of worrisome. Um, finally, do rational functions agree with different methods and polynomials? Um, in all the examples, I did polynomials because they're easy to see and the roots are easy to find. Uh, but it, it, it also works with rational functions, and in the final program, you could plug in rational functions as well. So that would be something to um, look into. Uh, I'd like to thank Dr. Bob, as well as Preston Hardy, and the CSB SJU community, and all of you for watching. So thank you. Are there any questions? Did you ever try like varying the polynomials slightly and seeing if that was a continuous change or did that have jumps as well? Um, we did, yeah, we did vary, you mean like multiplying by certain... I mean actually varying the values of the polynomial yep. functions. Okay, yep, we did that. Um, we, what we did is we started by multiplying by scalars to see what that did and we actually found that um, if you multiply a scalar it doesn't change it at all, which you can show by a pretty trivial uh, proof. Um, as for varying the numbers, it changed the roots, and so it's hard to tell because that changes the colors as well. Okay. Um, but that would be really interesting to look into. Okay, I guess we'll thank our speaker. Oh, do you have a few pictures with the around Christmas on the walls? Um, you should show them. Okay, I wanted to, but I do. <laughs> she has Christmas ornaments. They're really cool. We and actually get way too excited about them. <laughs> that was the first thing that Dr. Bob told me when we did this research. Is he was like, if we got a 3D printer, these would make the coolest Christmas ornaments. <laughs> <laughs> that would be the nerdiest Christmas tree. <laughs> <laughs> and this is the audience for that. <laughs>
Sampai